like what you receive as first. And it's, it's, it's probably the first time I feel genuinely nervous because I think you guys have selected um, brilliant speakers, so not, not just excellent researchers. And usually I, 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 when I speak at a, uh, at a school, I usually win the award of the best lecturer, I think, without any problems, but I think this time is... <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, the, the topic is, is an interesting one, a bit more of an academic topic at some level. Uh, there are applications to it as well, and I will get to that. So it's not all dry. Um, it's exciting because it asks some of these very fundamental questions that broadly um, get most of us to, to, to like physics at the beginning and, uh, and, and continue to, to do it. So basically the, the, the plan of the lectures, and, and please feel free to interrupt me at any stage, I really didn't plan them properly. I have a rough idea what I want to say uh, in, in each of these three lectures, but, uh, but I don't really, I can deviate it at any stage. So basically the rough idea is, is to tell you a little bit about similarities between the way we understand entanglement um, and the way we phrase thermodynamics. Um, in fact, I probably want to argue a bit more strongly that, that the two structures at some level are really one and the same. And it's always exciting to a, to a, to a theoretical physicist, at least when you discover that two uh, at first sight completely different branches of physics happen to have the same underlying mathematical structure. Um, that's just stimulating intellectually, I suppose, at first sight, because it makes you ask, is this an accident? Uh, or is there a fundamental reason why these, these two should be the same? Uh, is there something deeper, in a way? And we like questions like that, because that's what we're trying to do, understand the universe. There's, of course, a practical uh, benefit of that as well, because you can say everything that we've learned about thermodynamics, and it's been something like 200 years of thermodynamics, I suppose. Uh, we can now try to apply to entanglement, and we can get lots of these results for free. Um, and, and, and that's probably one of the directions that I want to explore a little bit. So we will go from, from, you know, from thermodynamics um, to entanglement, um, and this is going to be entanglement in, in what we call, of course, obviously enough now, thermodynamical limits. So the first, the first uh, lecture, I probably want to, want to talk about n tending to infinity, which means I'm going to be dealing with infinitely many, so to speak, copies of the same entangled state. And then these two really become formally identical. Now, what's interesting is that Practically, we had to we had to ask the question of of what happens to entanglement in the finite limit. So that's probably what I'll you know if everything goes well, and you don't ask me too many questions, but please do if you if you have them. Then basically, I will talk about n finite and how to characterize entanglement in the finite limit. And then you will say, oh wow, now it's completely different to thermodynamics. We lost all the links. But in fact, that's not really true. Um, so you see, practically, people jumped on this immediately simply because it's very difficult to make infinitely many copies of entangled states in the lab. It's even difficult to make two copies. So you know, you're not even close to the thermodynamic limit. Uh, so it's, it's driven by a necessity to look at, um, to look at finite, finite limits. Uh, thermodynamics started the other way around. You, look, you looked at very big objects. Um, you looked at classical macroscopic systems, so it was already in the thermodynamical limit. It didn't make sense to ask what happens if a single atom is, is doing the work for you in a cycle. But now it does. Um, and people call this quantum or nanothermodynamics. This is a big thing now. You know, lots of people are jumping into it. And there are lots of arguments back and forth because I think it's completely unclear how to phrase certain, certain things. Um, and almost every researcher has his uh, uh, favorite way of, of doing stuff at this level. So I hope to tell you a little bit about that. So it's interesting that somehow thermodynamics influenced the way we think about entanglement. And then we went from the thermodynamic to the finite limit, and now we are going back into the finite thermodynamics. So it's, it's really like completely incestual, the whole thing, so to speak. I don't know, that's, that's probably not the right word. <laughs> uh, finite thermodynamics. Um, 
And, and this is a hot topic, like I said, simply because people, people do look at nano, nano engines these days and that's all, all these quantum technologies are, are already at that level. You have to ask that question now. It's just a necessity, experimentally speaking. Um, and I want to also show that the way we understand finite manipulation of, of entanglement is in fact the right basis for finite thermodynamics. They become one and the same again. So the, and, and, and in the infinite limit, if you start from finite and take the infinite limit, you will recover the usual manipulations at this level. So it's all nice and neat and compact. And that's probably what I want to really tell you about uh, in, in at least two of these lectures. Then at the end, I want to go into this, uh, the, the deeper questions uh, that I said. And, and of course, the deepest question here is really irreversibility. So I think most of you will know that uh, the thermodynamics started out. So let me just summarize the, the basics of that so that I can contrast it with entanglement. Most of you know that the second law of thermodynamics was actually how thermodynamics began. It was discovered before the energy con conservation in some sense. And, and so Carnot in, 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 in 1820s uh, constructed, constructed an idealized cycle and then he formulated the second law, which says something like, um, the most efficient um, engine is my engine, basically. So that's what Car Carnot said in his, in his little book. Um, and, and, and that's it. That's basically, um, uh, that's the formulation. And you know, you can phrase it in X number of other equivalent ways. And I think we're going to switch from, from between dif these different ways because it's gonna be more interesting to understand entanglement is in as many different ways as possible. Um, and so basically Carnot came up with that. Um, and, and then of course the first law was discovered um, by a medic, funnily enough, who looked, at, uh, who looked at circulation of blood and looked at the connection between the color of your blood and the oxygen intake. And then he found all sorts of variations there. And then he somehow speculated that, that this comes out of energy conservation. So, so it's not the physicists who came up with that, funnily enough. Um, and that was the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and and the, the whole surprise about the second law is that, is that it's not enough for a process to satisfy energy conservation. You need something on top of it. Um, and so there are processes which are energy conserving, but they're still impossible according to, to Carnot, according to the second law. And so the second law is even more restrictive than the first law. Um, and of course, most of you know that, that ultimately this was, I think, phrased by, uh, by Clausius who said, um, you know, I come up with, a, with an entity called the entropy and he, if the total entropy of the, of the universe goes down, then this should not be allowed by the, by the laws of physics. And that's probably the most general formulation of the second law that, um, that we have. Uh, and it's nice to phrase it with, with entropy because, because of course then it becomes, even mathematically, uh, very suggestive that we should somehow link uh, our understanding of entanglement to, to entropy. So, as you know, people gained more and more confidence with, with thermodynamics. So that's also why it's exciting, because it's one of those theories that is almost used as a meta theory. It kind of sits above the dynamical laws. And people even use thermodynamics to rule out new theories. So you come up with a new theory. For example, Rob here has a new theory uh, called the box world. And you might hear about it a little bit tomorrow. And you construct a cycle out of that, and you find out that the second law is violated. Uh, I'm just guessing. I don't think that's the case in, in his theory. Uh, but if you find that out, you can safely throw that theory out of the window, because it's not good. That's how confident we are about the second law. And I think Eddington was, was the first person to phrase it as strongly as that, you know? Um, he said something like, there is nothing but for your theory to suffer deepest humiliation, or something like that. That's how bad it is if you contradict the second law. Um, and, and, and it did survive, it did survive both relativity as well as quantum physics. So thermodynamics, 
never really had to be modified. The first and the second law are still there, and they are valid in spite of the two revolutions that basically changed everything else we understand. Thermodynamics remains intact. In fact, Planck came up with the quantization hypothesis by sticking to thermodynamics because it was so shaky. You know, he wasn't sure whether to change Maxwell's equations or to change Newton's laws. Something had to give because you couldn't derive black body. And he said, what, what shall I then stick to? What, what's, what's firmer than these two? And he said, I'm going to stick to the second law of thermodynamics. I think he's still correct. And the first law as well, and somehow he had some voodoo argument, in which case, and I think most of you know this history of quantum mechanics. So basically, thermodynamics was even used to guide people when, when other theories failed to provide the right answer. And some people believe that this might be the case now as well. I think this is an exciting idea. I want to tell you about it at the very end of the third lecture. It's a complete speculation. It's wild. Okay? <coughs> And you should probably not trust me at all at that stage. I'll warn you before I start probably talking nonsense at some stage. <laughs> but I think it's really suggestive to think that maybe even the next theory, whatever people call post-quantum theories or quantum gravity or whatever you think will come next, if it does, will also be somehow governed by a deep principle that very much resembles thermodynamics. I have an idea. I stole it from David Deutsch, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. Okay? Probably slightly differently. Uh, to what he has to say about it. So that's the plan. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the thermodynamic limit, then I'll go into the finite uh, into the finite case, and then basically I'll talk about the foundations uh, of, of that. And like I said, the biggest surprise of the second law is, is, is this fact that, that um, it tells you that certain processes, even though they, they satisfy energy cons conservation, they are still not allowed. And in fact, the tendency in nature is for entropy to increase. And this is something that we're still struggling to understand. So this irreversibility that comes out of thermodynamics, but it doesn't come out of anything else we know in physics, is a deep mystery that people still argue about. Where does it come from? Um, you know, why do we think that, that quantum physics is the right theory and it's fully reversible when that looks in blatant conflict with the irreversibility that we see everywhere around us. How do we reconcile these two things? And given that I claim that these two are one and the same at some level, does entanglement at some stage also suggest certain kind of irreversibility that's out there in nature? I think this is really a fantastic question. Uh, there are probably many answers to that. Um, but but I'll, tell you, uh, I'll tell you one probably simple way of understanding these things. Um, so first, let me, let me go through let me go a little bit through entanglement uh, logic and, and, and tell you why, um, why um, we, we use entropy to, to, to understand entanglement as well. So historically, um, historically it came from the first time at least I, I've ever seen this used is, is in Everett's, Everett's Many Worlds uh, thesis. So Everett, of course, had a... Um, had a problem with, um, uh, sorry, he was not the only one who has this problem, but basically he didn't like the projection postulate, of course. I mean, I guess Paul Neumann was really the first person who, who said, you know, we have these two different types of evolutions. One is unitary and the other one is the collapse. And how do we reconcile that? So that's already, that was already raised at the very beginning of quantum mechanics. And then Everett said, well, you don't really need the projection postulate. You never need to talk about measurement. You never need to talk about collapse or anything else. And then the question arises, how do I quantify then uh, measurements if I don't really ever talk about uh, the, the collapse of the, of, the, of the wave function? And Everett said that's really very easy. Um, so the way he thought about it is that you have the state of your system. Uh, let's, let's, use, let's use a qubit just to make it very simple. And then you have a state um, of your measurement apparatus, whatever it is, in some state zero, let's say. Let's call it M zero. Um, and Everett said, all I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about <coughs> when, I, when I describe a measurement is, is establishment of correlations between these two systems. And that's gonna be a unitary transformation. Uh, it's like a control gate, I think most of you know this as well. So this is a transformation where 
where you don't really change the state of the apparatus if the qubit is in the state zero. And if the qubit is in the state one, you go into some orthogonal state M1. You can even describe what people call weak measurements, imperfect measurements, P of EMs, whatever language you like to use, by, by relaxing the condition of orthogonality and saying these two don't really have to be orthogonal. In which case, I'm not really discriminating the states zero and one perfectly. That's completely immaterial, actually, for both. So you can allow whatever you like. So Everett says, here we go. Uh, the state after this kind of unitary transformation is simply um, an entangled state. Between, between the system and the, and the measurement apparatus. That's it, it's done. You don't need to project anything. That's it, that's the measurement for you. So it's nice because, you know, rather than saying this world is schizophrenic and there are two types of processes, there is a collapse, which is a measurement type of process, and there is also unitarity, this guy says there is no collapse, it's all unitary. Um, and if you think that the universe is a, is a closed system and governed by, by, by quantum mechanics, then this makes sense. You know, there's no one outside making any projections and making any measurements. Um, so that's it. Now, of course, you have, you have an issue there because you want to describe how much information the measurement apparatus gained about the state of the system. And Everett was at that time, this was in the 50s, so he was familiar with Shannon's, um, Shannon's information theory, which came at least, I think, 10 years before, before Everett's logic. And, and he knew that when you have two correlated systems, you can easily now uh, describe, uh, describe that using, using Shannon's, Shannon's entropy. Um, so let me, let, me, let me describe the logic, how, how Everett thought about it. Um, he thought about it in the following way. Um, he looked at something that's called, um, that's called um, mutual information. So he said, imagine I make a, imagine I, I want to look at the state of my system. Then if I don't know anything about the measurement apparatus, I have, I have a mixed state. So if, if I were to trace out the, the second, the measurement apparatus, I'm just going to assume that A and B are real, so I don't have to write nodes all the time. So basically, your mixture uh, of, of states of the system will look like that. So you see, that's why, in a way, if you neglect the state of your measurement apparatus, you already have a kind of collapse, in the sense that your system is no longer in a, in a superposition of states. It's really in a mixture of states. So you've kind of solved half of the measurement problem, in some sense. People say this is not a solution. Because in real world, we either see zero or one. We don't see a mixture, really. So where does that come from? I, I don't know that, of course. I mean, I haven't solved the measurement problem myself either, but I'm just telling you how far you can push it. And it's really, it's really just a, a way of motivating quantifying entanglement. So the amount of information that the, that the apparatus gets about the system is, in fact, equal to the amount of entanglement between the two. If you have no entanglement between the two, as you don't at the beginning, there is no information. So if you look at the measurement apparatus, it doesn't tell you anything about the state of the system. If you looked at the measurement apparatus here, and if you get M0, then you know that the system is in the state zero. If you looked at M1, you know that the system is in the state one. And this is exactly the logic of Shannon. Shannon said, Alice has a bit string. She sends that bit string to Bob. Bob looks at his output and tries to conclude what was the original bit string that was sent by Alice? It's exactly the same scenario as here. Um, so Alice is here, Bob is here, so to speak, the measurement apparatus. You look at the apparatus and you conclude about the state of the system. So it, it really is suitable to use his logic. So here is, here is a mixture of, of, of zero and one, and basically the entropy of that, the uncertainty you have about the state, if you didn't look at the apparatus, would simply be uh, Shannon's um, entropy, which goes like that. Um, of course, you can ask, why are you using that particular form? It's clear that the uncertainty has to be some function of, of a squared and b squared. These are your probabilities to get 0 and 1. But why this function? 
Um, so if the systems are not entangled, this will be zero. And if the systems are maximally entangled, this would be equal to one. So the kind of the two extremes are satisfied. But in between, the function looks concave, and, and there are many other concave functions I could come up with. There are infinitely many, in fact. Um, and it's not a crazy question at all. Um, this form only makes sense in the thermodynamic limit. Otherwise, you really should be using something else. And that's what I want to get to in the, in the second lecture. So this is not the right entropy if, you're, if, you, if you have only a single or any finite number of copies of this type. This only makes sense in the infinite limit. I'll try to argue for that at some stage as well. For Shannon, this was a no-brainer because he was talking about exchange of classical bits of information. And so he could easily take the thermodynamic limit because you can generate as many classical bits as you like. But when you come to generating entangled states, it's not as easy as that to have the thermodynamic limit. And that, that's what I said motivated the finite, the finite case. So basically, Everett said, here is, here is, here is the, the, the information due to the coupling between the measurement apparatus and the system. You gain exactly this much information because the uncertainty about the system before you look at the measurement apparatus is this. After you look at the measurement apparatus, there is no uncertainty because if you see M0, you know the system is 100% in the state zero. And if you see M1, you know that you get this. So there is no uncertainty about the state of the system. And the difference between the two is exactly this entity here. So that tells you how much information you gain. And for us, this is exactly equal to the amount of entanglement uh, between the system plus the measurement operators, if you like. Um, so it's really all nicely uh, put together and motivated. And now you can say, well, that's really interesting. So that's what I said. The fact, immediately, as soon as you see something like that, um, you can say, oh, but that's really interesting because now this is the same entropy that, uh, that Boltzmann was using more or less. I mean, this is the entropy of statistical mechanics. And statistical mechanics underpins thermodynamics and you can derive it uh, formally. And so you can ask, is this now an accident? Or, or, or is there something deeper? Why are we using exactly the same quantity as in statistical mechanics? And it appears in information theory as well, as I said. So somehow information theory is almost like a bridge between these two, uh, between these two structures. Um, and Everett almost, almost had an answer to, uh, to that as well. That was interesting that, uh, that he went in that direction. I only discovered this much, much later after we started the whole game of manipulating entanglement. And I'm going to go into, into that uh, for, the, for the remaining part of the first lecture. But, but basically, what Everett said in his paper, and this is interesting, Everett said, look, if, um, if I now allow some kind of stochastic process to, so if I take, take two random variables, one of them can come from making a measurement on, on one subsystem and the other one on the other subsystem and look at the correlations between these two random variables. So basically, let me give you a, a, a physical picture. He didn't really speak about it in terms of entangled pairs at that time and so on, but basically what he had in mind is like this. Two particles, you make some measurement here, and that gives you certain probability distribution of outcomes. And you make some measurement here, and that gives you another probability distribution. And these two will be correlated in general, if, you're, if, you're, if your particles are correlated. And now Everett looked at the information between A and B. And that's some kind of quantity of this type, depending on how correlated they are. And you can, of course, extend this to any, to any dimension. Now, what he asks next is interesting as well. He says, what if this guy as a probability distribution undergoes some kind of stochastic, um, I'm being as, as vague as I can at this stage. I'll formalize it probably a little bit later. I just want to give you the general idea. What if this guy undergoes a stochastic evolution? So this, is a, this gives you a probability distribution, and then you multiply that by some kind of stochastic matrix, which effectively gives you another probability distribution. 
But what it means physically is what if this undergoes some kind of open system evolution? And what if this guy does the same and results in some other probability distribution B? So you send A and B through a noisy channel, if you like. Uh, that would be the information theorist way of talking about it. And whatever it says, and he proves it formally, is he says this information cannot be increased by, by having these kind of operations. Okay? So whatever you did to these guys is bound to be smaller, in general, than your initial information. Some people would call this data processing inequality. So if I have certain data originally, A and B, and I'm saying, is there something I can do to manipulate this to get even more information? The answer is no. Whatever you got at the beginning is as good as it gets. Okay? So things can only get worse. And now, if I phrase it like this, it's starting to sound like the second law of thermodynamics. But I'm just talking about correlations. I'm not talking about the entropy of the universe. So he already Everett notices that there is a certain unidirectional trend in correlations. So if two systems are correlated, but you insist on manipulating them separately, then the correlations are going to go down. And they're going to go down and down until you destroy them completely. Each of them will settle into some local equilibrium, and that's it. Okay? Sounds like the second law. Is it the second law? Is it something in addition to the second law? Is it completely different to the second law? Can I derive the second law from this kind of logic? These are the, the really cool questions, I think. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll hope to give you some kind of answer at some stage today about that. I think the answer is yes, they are the same. But it doesn't look obvious at this stage. So, and, and this is, of course, a typical scenario in physics. You have a gas of atoms, two atoms collide, they get entangled. Then they fly away, and if you have a large number of atoms, they are highly unlikely to meet again. So this kind of logic that your information and correlations go down is almost at the heart of Boltzmann's derivation of the increase of the famous H theory. People still argue about that. But killing correlations is the trend uh, that gives you the entropy increase. It's not an accident. It really is one and the same, one and the same uh, thing. Um, so now let me let me let me te give you the scenario for entanglement, and then I'll show you then I'll show you formally how to derive some of these things. So we're still sticking to the thermodynamic limit, and I will show you why expressions of this type <coughs> make sense, and we can actually say there is a unique way of talking about uh, about this. Does it make sense so far? Any questions? It's a good one to ask a question if you have one. It's hopefully very slow and very boring, and everyone understands everything, which is which is good news. Eh? I hope. Are you happy? <laughs> All right. So now the next the next uh, uh, the next part will get a little bit more formal. And and the question the question there that uh, that people uh, started to ask. So this was sometime in the in the mid 90s. Um, was really motivated. So there was a there was a really inspirational paper by by Sandro Popescu and I think Rolich at um, it's 96 or 7, I don't remember now. But this paper really just said, look, we can we can think of manipulating entanglement by local means in the same way as Carnot thought about Carnot cycles. So they noticed, and from that, if you, once you understand that these two are one and the same, you can immediately derive uh, what is the most optimal way of manipulating entangled states. It just comes out for free. And it's all governed by this entropy logic. So basically the scenario is like this. I've got, I've got n copies um, of, of some entangled state. So this notation just means I really identically prepared n copies, and this psi um, is whatever it is. It could be something like what we had before, a0, 0, plus b1. So the logic applies to any dimensionality, but if we stick to qubits, it's going to be nice and easy to calculate and, uh, and simple to explain. Mm. And then the question is, uh, imagine I want to, imagine I want to uh, squeeze out as much entanglement as possible. So 
in, in, in the starting state, A and B uh, may not be equal to one another, which means this is not a maximally entangled state. So remember from the entropy logic, if A equals B, um, then you get the maximum amount of entanglement between the two. And any other ratio of the two will give you, will give you less entanglement. Um, and then the question is, how many copies? Uh, so this is really a, a pragmatic way of defining entanglement even. The question is, how many copies can I get of a maximally entangled state? Um, which is this one. If, and this is, this is an extremely important restriction, if I have uh, transformations which are completely local, um, to the system one and two. So I'm not allowed to make any global unitary transformation on both of them. Anything that, that, that that's allowed here is basically Alice makes uh, makes whatever she likes on, 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 on her qubit and Bob makes whatever operation he likes on his qubit. They can communicate classically, but that's as best as, as it gets. So these are these operations that are, that are known as LOCC, local operations and classical communication. And the question is, what is the best uh, that uh, that you can uh, that you can achieve in this case, and and of course, um, so the way that the paper argued is the paper argued that, that the most efficient way of doing this is if you could really unitarily transform one state into the other one, because when you have a unitary transformation, you don't lose any information, any other transformation like open systems, dynamics will actually erase part of your information. So the most efficient operation should be a unitary one. This is the same argument as kind of used for reversible um, transformations in thermodynamics. So the best that you should be able to hope to do is some kind of transformation on Alice's side. Possibly you need one on, on Bob's side. As it happens, you don't, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and, and with this kind of transformation, you take n copies um, of psi, and you end up, let me call this state phi plus, so I don't have to keep writing it down all the time. You end up with, with n copies of, of psi, of phi plus. And now the question is, of course, what is n given n? You want to know the efficiency of that. Um, so this m divided by n is exactly like, like the efficiency in the Carnot cycle. Um, so you're thinking of this as, as, as your invested amount of entanglement, which would be like the invested work in a Carnot cycle. And you think of this um, as the amount of work you get out of your cycle. And the question is, what is the best ratio I can get? And they argue that, so this is a very intuitive paper. It's written in a way that there is no mathematics there. You just have to, you just have to accept that intuitively it makes sense that it's a unitary transformation. They don't really go through the details of, of how you do it. And, and basically what happens now is that, is that the quantity that gets, um, that gets preserved when you have a unitary transformation is the entropy. So unitary transformations preserve the entropy. And what that means is that if you look at the entropy of the reduced state of either Alice or Bob, remember I said these states look like mixtures of um, 0 and 1 with these probabilities. The total entropy on Alice's side is n times the entropy of this state. That's the, that's the input entropy. If I have a unitary transformation, then I've preserved entropy by definition. And what comes out is m copies of a maximally entangled state. But the entropy, when, when a and b are equal to one another, the entropy of that is unit entropy. So it's really formally m times 1. And here is an entropy conserving process because it's unitary it's intuitively the best you can do because anything else is bound to reduce the probability of, of getting things right. And therefore the ratio of the two now really ends up being, being equal to the, um, to the entropy. Okay? Okay. So basically this entropy is what we had before. 
I'll show you how to do it. That's probably the last thing I want to do to show you this uh, to show you this formula. So basically, it's a very beautiful paper. Um, it didn't end up in, in PRL at the time, interestingly enough, because one of the referees, and this was Asher Perez, I know it because he told me that. Um, and I had the same paper at the same time which went into PRL, and he was happily telling me that mine was more formal and he thought that should go into PRL. I think he set it up in rapid communication, but it's a far more beautiful paper, I would say. Um, and, um, and basically, <coughs> so the reason why I didn't end up there is because it was too fluffy, and it was fluffy in exactly the way I'm telling you. I'm not making it fluffier than it was, okay? But, but it's very intuitive, and we love fluffy arguments, you know, in physics, uh, because, because it guides you um, through complicated math. And so basically, they said you can do it. But of course, the question here now that you ask immediately is, is can I unitarily transform a bunch of states like this to, to a bunch of states like that? So all is nice and fine. You are telling me if there is a unitary transformation, entropy will be conserved, and this is my measure of, of entanglement that I can distill. But it all hinges on the fact that I'm postulating that there is a, a unitary transformation. And in fact, I can tell you that there is no unitary transformation for any finite end. This cannot be done. So the, you know what I mean? Th that's why, in the finite case, we have to go into different, uh, completely different maths and logic. And that, that's what I'm going to try to do uh, in, the next, in the next lecture. But basically, if you could really transform them, and when n becomes larger and larger in the thermodynamic limit you can do this and you get this really exact result. So, so this is really only true uh, when n tends to infinity. Um, then you get a unique number and that's this entropy and this is how much entanglement you can squeeze out of a non-maximally um, entangled initial state. Um, and, um, and basically the logic goes like this. Um, it's, it's all a consequence of something that people call the law of large numbers. So the way, the way you argue for this is like this. Look at, look at this state here, a squared 0 plus b squared 1. Okay. Now imagine I have n copies of this state. So remember, this will only be half of the entangled state. This is only the qubit analysis side, or on Bob's side, and I'm thinking of n of these. Of n of, so basically, I have lots of, lots of these pairs, and what I'm doing is I'm going to look at the state on Alice's side. And, and I have n copies of this. And now you're expanding these strings. So what this is going to give you is this is going to give you n bit strings which are going to be some combinations of zeros and ones, okay? But the larger this n becomes, one string becomes exponentially more likely than all the other strings. And in the limit, it becomes probable with unit probability. You can actually ignore anything else that possibly comes out. And I'll, I'll show you how this uh, arises. So basically, you know that because the typical string if you make n really large, the typical string will be the one that has um, that has n times a squared zeros and n times b squared ones. Okay. So if you had a fair if you had a fair coin, if a squared was the same as b squared, then the typical strings would be the ones that contain the same numbers of zeros and ones. And that's the case for the maximally entangled state if you look at one half of that. But if you don't have the same probability for zero and one, then the typical string is the one, so this is n bits in total. I was just expanding all of one of them, if you like, one of the terms uh, here. Then the typical string is going to have n a squared, this is the probability to get zero, zeros and n b squared ones. And obviously the sum, because a squared plus b squared is one, the sum of these two is still n, as it should be. And so now you ask yourself, what is the probability for me to get that sequence? Okay. So what is the probability 
for a typical sequence. So this is something that's called typical. Anything of this form, where you shuffle zeros and ones in any order you like, as long as you preserve the ratio, is something that's known as a typical sequence, a typical subspace, if you use the quantum measure. So basically, if you now look at this, and you look at the probability for this string, <coughs> the probability is simply a squared, which is the probability to get zero, times the number of zeros that you get. So it's a squared to the power of n times a squared, times b squared to the power of n times b squared. Okay? It's a simple one. So this is like tossing a fair coin 10 times and asking what's the probability of a sequence with five zeros and five ones. And you have to take one half to the power of whatever, 10, right, in this case. But in this case, the probabilities are different. And, of co and, and now the trick is to write this in an exponential way. So take 2 to the log. I'm using log base 2 because I'm always thinking in terms of bits. You could use natural log and raise it to the Euler number e. It doesn't make any difference for this argument. But if I take the log of this entity here, you can see that this is going to be log of this plus log of that. And in fact, so it's just that I'm super lazy to write it down. I will expand it immediately. It's 2 to the um, n a squared log a squared plus n b squared log b squared. And if I factor n out and put a minus sign in front, I have the usual entropy that we wrote down before. So here is how entropy comes comes about. So the probability of each of these sequences, when I have many copies, so you can only do this. You see, I'm, I'm being a typical physicist. I'm always cavalier. Those of you who know me will know that I'm always cavalier with maths. Probably I'd get shot if there was a single mathematician in the audience now. But, but fortunately, you're not. Uh, of that type, I, I, I hope. So basically, all of this should only tend to this kind of result when n tends to infinity. Otherwise, there is a correction that you have to put in due to the finite n. But when n goes to infinity, this all becomes nice. And if you ask for the number, so what is the size of this subspace? What is the size of the typical uh, subspace? It's basically 2 to the n times the entropy of this guy. Why? Because the size, the number of strings times the probability for each string has got to equal 1. Because I claim that in the thermodynamic limit there is nothing else there. It's just conservation of probability. The, the number of these guys times the probability has got to equal 1. So this is the same number but just with a plus sign there. So this is the number. So as you're expanding this qubit analysis side, this is how many typical strings you have. And then you say, but why don't I take a transformation, a unitary transformation? So now I take a huge unitary transformation. That's this guy here, UA. I take a huge unitary transformation that rotates this vector into the vector where zeros and ones appear with an equal probability. Because what I want to generate is a maximally entangled state. And for this state, A squared is b squared is equal to a half. So I rotate the whole typical subspace into another typical subspace. How do I know that, that I can do that unitarily? Because I'm preserving the size of the subspace. I just need to take each of these vectors and rotate it unitarily into another sequence of zeros and ones. And as long as they're the same size, I can always unitarily change the basis. It's a basis change. And I'm changing into a basis of this type. But what I'm doing when I do that is I'm preserving the number of states there. And you know already that the number of strings I have for the maximally entangled state is simply 2 to the power of n. The same argument is here. So n times 1, because the entropy of that state is 1, when a is equal to b. And here is the conservation. 
if I do the whole thing unitarily, and this is already done here by construction, I've just constructed the process for you. I don't even, I'm not arguing in a fluffy way anymore. Modular that I'm not taking limits properly and all the other stuff that mathematicians do. But if you equate these two subspaces, and that's equivalent to having a unitary transformation, then you can see immediately that M has got to be equal to N times the entropy. And this entropy is therefore the measure of entanglement, the ratio of M and N. It's as formal as it gets. Okay? But it was really the IBM bunch uh, who came up with a, with a formal argument, uh, something in 95, 6, or 7, similar time. All of these papers and ideas appeared at about mm -hmm. the same time. So the summary here, and I'm going to stop and give you a break. Um, the summary of all of that is that if you are talking about infinitely many entangled states and trying to manipulate and go from one type of an entangled state, which is um, less entangled, to the maximally entangled state, which would be, intuitively speaking, the analog of, of feeding in some heat into your Carnot cycle and asking what's the maximum amount of work I can get, then the answer is that the maximum uh, you can get is if you, if you do local unitary transformations, and you can do that only in the thermodynamic limit, and the answer comes out to be the same good old entropy that also governs the Carnot cycle. So in some sense, this is really not, uh, not, an, uh, not an accident. Um, I'll, I suggest uh, that we take a break until 3 o'clock, so almost or maybe a few minutes after that, 10 minutes. And then when we come back, I'll, I'll go into the, I'll go into the uh, finite domain and show you how entanglement has to be described when you only have one copy or a finite number of copies. And then I'm going to swing back into thermodynamics and tell you what that teaches, and, uh, teaches us about thermodynamics. So, 10 minutes.